Welcome to day four of DSEI 2017. This is our inaugural People and Skills Day, following on from our very successful rising stars of previous exhibition. And our focus is on defence's most important resource, our people. We want to understand better how we can develop and foster the skills of our people right across the defence and security sectors. There are three highlights today. Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Defence People and Veterans, Tobias Elwood, will give a keynote address. The Defence Growth Partnership will be launching a new initiative into skills development and international partnerships. Lieutenant General Richard Nugy, Chief of Defence People, will give a keynote address. We hope you enjoy this very important inaugural People and Skills Day at DSEI 2017. DSEI really is a fantastic showcase and this has been a record-breaking show in terms of the number of exhibitors, the number of people coming through and it highlights some of the most innovative technology in the world and it also enables people to see uh, how much the UK itself has managed to invent and develop over the last couple of years since the last show. Now the last mile competition was to try and find better ways of resupplying the front line, obviously the most dangerous place on a battlefield. And so we've narrowed it down to some finalists who are helping us develop autonomous and unmanned ways in which we can resupply the front line. And it's been a really exciting competition which is developing some very innovative ideas. Last week we announced the competition for our Type 31 E frigate and the E stands for exports. What we're trying to do now is when we are designing something that the ultimate customer will be, for example in this case the Royal Navy, that we also factor in an exportable price and an exportable capability and build it modularly so that for the first time for 40 years the UK is in a position to actually export a warship. Obviously it has to have the capability that the Royal Navy needs and we've set down a challenge to industry in terms of naming the price but what we're hearing is that that's something that industry thinks is very achievable. Of course it's uh, meant that it's a much more competitive marketplace for us and I believe competition is one of the ways that we can drive innovation and drive down prices and get the right equipment for our armed forces. I think we all are in violent agreement that starting with 2014 we did not only see a change in the international security environment, we saw a significant change indicating that warfare in Europe might be an option again. We need to prepare for winning the next conflict and that is of course in order to re-establish a deterrent posture in Europe but on the other side we are well aware that we need to maintain a 360 degree perspective on how conflict might develop. Day four of DSCI and DSCI TV is snuck in before the visitors start flooding in. We are at the cohort stand and we've been joined by Andrew Thomas, Chief Executive, who's going to talk a little bit about the presence here at the show. Andrew, what's it been like? It's been a great show. Uh, we've had plenty of customer meetings, we've had a lot of delegations through, a lot of good conversations, so I'm very pleased with it so far. What sort of capabilities, platforms and systems are you really trying to push forward, trying to showcase? Well, we've got a lot of really exciting technology on the stand, so I would urge people to come and see us. But just to pick out a few, um, we have the, uh, a great demonstration of the Crate Sonar Array, which is a low-profile uh, array sonar, capable of giving a really, really solid anti-submarine capability, even to ships of the OPV or Corvette size, so really suitable uh, for navies uh, where, that, where those ships are, are most prevalent. Um, and it's generating an awful lot of interest. Um, another uh, particularly a good example uh, I would highlight is uh, something we have right here. Uh, Marlborough Communications, one of our subsidiaries, is showing the Diametrics counter UAV system, extremely suitable for civil applications. It's legal to use in the UK, although it does have a jamming signal. It's, it's within all of the relevant uh, legal parameters and very, very effective, a good system for critical national infrastructure, prisons and so on. So there's a lot to see. When you say maritime technology and uh, counter UAS, those two are particularly uh, popular, very, very, very sort of uh, present in terms of tech base. Have you, have you had much sort of push forward, any interest from potential customers in that regard? 
Uh, yes, a, a lot of interest. I think, the f and the fact that we can showcase this technology at a greater exhibition like DSCI, where there's a great opportunity to interact with customers, I think you know really helps them to understand what it is that we can do for them. Andrew, thank you very much for your time. So over on the Inspire stand, we've got the targeted Fidelity simulator being showcased. It looks quite technical, although to a layman, maybe it looks like a computer game. We've got Chris here who can explain a little bit more about the capabilities. Chris, a little bit about the system, please. Uh, the targeted Fidelity simulator is a device that we've recently developed to try and bridge the gap between the flat panel variants of simulators and the full motion simulators. Um, so what you have here is you have a visual display coupled with uh, a Augusta 109 um, replica cockpit uh, with a software giving the tactical scenario generation in the background. As an operator, uh, what's the difference between simulated flight and actual flight and also between the flat panel and also the curved one that we've got behind us? So the difference between simulated flight and actual flight, there can be a wealth of differences and you can try and bridge the gap as much as you want to by increasing uh, the capability of the simulator more and more. For example, developing the flight model, improving the uh, image generation, etc. So what you will find is, um, for example, in the real aircraft, you have greater peripheral vision than maybe you do in the simulator. You have feeling, of which we don't have here because we've got a fixed base variant. Um, or you could go for a full motion simulator, which they give you a feeling as well. But all of those little things um, will make the difference between real flying and a simulator flying. Obviously simulators are being used more and more uh, for military training. What are the benefits? That I guess cost would be one of them. Cost is a significant benefit and it, of course it depends upon the tech, aircraft type which you are you are flying. An aircraft like an Apache or something like that would probably be costing 20 to 40 thousand pounds an hour whereas you could be getting in a simulator for you know a significantly better value. What you can do in a simulator that you can't do in a real aircraft, you can manipulate the environment, you can manipulate the scenario, which is something you might not be able to do um, in the real aircraft. Depend upon your location and depend upon um, the area in which you're able to operate. Well, DSCI TV finds itself on the Dragonfire UK stand where we understand uh, a, quite a capable piece of technology is being showcased for the first time. We're joined by Brian Colwell, who can explain a little bit more about it, if that's okay. Absolutely fine. So this is the beam director, the front end of the Dragonfire system. Behind this, we've got a new laser source, very exciting new piece of UK technology, command and control system, power, cooling. The whole system has been brought together by this interesting group of uh, industries in the UK. What does it do? How is it made? Well, what we're going to be doing is taking it up in 2019, up to the Hebrides to trial it out. And really, it's bringing together lots of elements of technologies that have had lots of investment over many years, and it's making sure we can really demonstrate that capability within the UK industry. Is it targeted for a specific programme? Is it purchased? What's the status? Well, it's currently under contract for a capability demonstrator programme, which was awarded this year. We're delivering in 2019, and as I mentioned, we've got to deliver the whole system, take it to the Hebrides and demonstrate that we really understand how laser-directed energy systems work. I imagine it's quite interesting for visitors to have a look at laser guns. What's the reception been like? The interest has been really key, actually. Secretary of State mentioned us very clearly in his speech yesterday, and we've had the second Sea Lord was here for about 20 minutes, referring to it as his new toy. Excellent. Thanks so much for your time. Well, DSCI TV, 
is on the BA Systems stand here at DCI 2017 and if ever a stand was designed to make themselves the centre of attention then the BA Systems one is doing just that. We're joined by Deborah Littell. Deborah, what's the reasoning behind the stand? Why have you done the design the way you've done it? Uh, well, we wanted to position ourselves as a technology-led company and so really the whole the stand design is around us positioning ourselves as this technology innovator, keeping our customers a step ahead and trying to showcase the complete breadth of our company. Are you maybe focusing on a certain type of capability, whether that's maritime or land, or is it just the broad spectrum that BA Systems has to offer? No, one of the good things about DSEI is it actually gives us the opportunity to showcase a complete breadth of our company, focusing on land, naval, cyber, and also the joint pieces as well. And finally, just about the interest in terms of visitors and delegations, what's that been like? Oh, great. It's always fantastic to come to this show. We always see such a broad, uh, range of customers, global customers, and it really does give us a great uh, um, opportunity to showcase our, our breadth of our capability. Protected vehicles uh, has been and continues to be one of the most competitive but potentially lucrative markets in the defence industry. We are in front of the Oshkosh stand and obviously they're showcasing the JLTV behind us. Being joined by George Mansfield, thanks so much for taking the time and having a chat with us. Explain a little bit about the platform and how it's being displayed here if you can. Sure. This is, this is our JLTV that, that we won a large contract in the US Army and, and Marine Corps. But this vehicle is going to be used to fulfill the requirements for the MRVP through an FMS case. And so as the MOD and the DOD work together on that FMS case, with this being, being the solution, we wanted to bring the vehicle over here um, and show it with, with some of the UK equipment on it that's in service today. Not necessarily what will go on MRVP, but, but what's in the service today. We've also got a remote weapon system up on top, and that remote weapon system is a Konensberg uh, protector light with a 762 machine gun on it. Also in the back corner, we're showing a uh, RPG net that is also in service today with the MOD. So, so we're showing this vehicle outfitted with some of the stuff here in the MOD. In terms of numbers in the US, how many vehicles and platforms are you selling into the US services, and how many vehicles and platforms might you sell into UK armed forces? Well, in the, in the U.S., we have an initial order that we received in 2015 for 17,000 vehicles, all right? We've delivered on delivery orders on that contract up to six delivery orders now. So we are delivering vehicles to the Marines and to the, to the Army, their joint program office today. Um, their ultimate uh, acquisition um, is going to be uh, about 50,000 for the Army and about 5,000 for the Marine Corps. So about 55,000 vehicles ultimately is, is what they will order. And as far as the UK, there was an article written in August, I believe, that, that from the State Department in the US approving an FMS case for the UK of up to 2,747. However, we don't know what that first delivery order for that vehicle will be because that's still within the DOD and the MOD um, and we're not privy to that information yet. Just finally, about the show itself, um, DSCI is obviously quite a significant uh, item on the agenda for, for a lot of companies. What, what sort of uh, attention and significance have you put it uh, for your company in terms of getting attention for your platforms and visitor interest? We've gotten great interest here at DESI this year. You know, uh, we've got a lot of foreign delegates from our NATO partners um, that are coming in to take a look at the vehicle maybe for the first time. So we're showing the vehicle to them. They're very interested in what the UK is doing with our DOD. Um, and so we're, we're talking about that, but very busy here with international uh, delegations. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.